afternoon. I'm Serena Collado, Director of Community Health at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset. We are pleased to offer today's webinar, Intestinal Fortitude, the Guts to Promote, promote Colon Health in Collaboration with Friends Health Connection. The colon, or large intestine, plays an important role in our body's digestive system, making and storing waste full stool. Today's webinar, we will learn more about how to keep the colon healthy, types of conditions that affect the colon, and ways to diagnose and treat those disorders. I am pleased to welcome our special guest, Dr. Alan Ingold, a gastroenterologist at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, we will begin today's webinar with about 20 minutes of a moderated discussion, followed by questions and answers from our audience. First, um, let's start off, Dr. Beagle, by you telling our audience a little bit about yourself. Um, what can I tell you? I am a gastroenterologist uh, at Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, I work uh, at Digestive Healthcare Center in Hillsborough. We also have an office in Warren and uh, Somerville as well. Uh, I did my training at Beth Israel Medical Center, where I did my fellowship as well, and um, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Michigan. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, so let's start by giving our viewers a kind of an overview of the colon, its role, and its role in the di uh, body's digestive process. Would you mind explaining? Sure. So the colon truthfully actually really has actually a limited role in digestion. Most of the digestion occurs higher up in the intestinal tract through the pancreas and through the small intestine. Uh, the colon's really main role is usually twofold. It is involved in water absorption, um, and it also is involved in the storage of stool. So it's actually sort of the last area before the stool is evacuated from the body. So what are some of the most common um, conditions that affect the colon? Uh, lots of different things can affect the colon. Um, I think most of the things that we think of uh, are things like colitis, which is a very broad category. It can include things like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, uh, but it can also include things like microscopic colitis, or even infections can cause it, what's known as an infectious colitis. Uh, IBS, uh, diarrhea, constipation, um, those are probably the, the most common things that we think of, diverticulosis, um, that affect the colon. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm sure probably colon cancer, right? March oh, is colon, colon cancer, retro. sure, certainly. Uh, we hope that yeah, we don't have to deal with that, True. but certainly uh, uh, it is uh, unfortunately uh, one of the Things, almost any organ, really, and not just almost any, any organ uh, can be affected by cancer. Uh, but certainly when you get cancer in the colon, it's known as colon cancer. Um, some uh, people do make a distinction between colon cancer and rectal cancer. Uh, rectal cancer is just cancer that's in the lower part of the colon and the rectum. Uh, and the reason the distinction typically is made is because the treatment for rectal cancer sometimes can be a little bit different than it can be for other parts of the colon. So you had given us a long list of different, you know, different conditions. Um, so can we go through maybe each one of them and explain what causes it? And, um, you know, I think I'm not sure if you had mentioned irritable bowel. Can you also I did. explain? Yeah, oh, sure. yeah, you can yeah. explain what it is, what causes each one of those different conditions. That would sure. be great. So irritable bowel is a very common condition. It's actually uh, one of the most common conditions that uh, people refer to a GI office for. Uh, about 30% of the referrals um, are estimated to be for irritable bowel. The hard part with irritable bowel is that there's no specific test that says, yes, you have irritable bowel. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, irritable bowel is typically a condition where there's been an alteration in uh, bowel habits, either constipation or diarrhea, and usually there's a component of abdominal pain as well. Uh, the causes are not really well known, unfortunately. Uh, there's some thought that it could be uh, from inflammation. There's uh, been multiple case reports of people who develop what's known as post-infectious IBS, so you get some type of gastroenteritis and then you develop irritable bowel type symptoms. Uh, it may be due to uh, an alteration in gut flora uh, with the bacteria that are in the gut. Um, there's been some thought that it may be involved in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And there's even been some thought that it may be a psychosocial uh, disease where there may be an imbalance in some of the neurotransmitters in the body, which play a role as well. But as of right now, the exact etiology is unknown. 
Um, some of the other things we had talked about were diverticulosis. Diverticulosis are uh, little pouches that form in the wall of the colon. Um, it um, basically uh, occurs probably as a combination of things. Uh, there's also certainly uh, people who strain or have a lot of constipation or there's increased pressure in the colon are going to be more prone to diverticulosis. But there's also uh, likely a dietary and genetic predisposition to diverticulosis as well. It's an exceedingly common condition. About 60% of people uh, up by the time they reach the age of 60 have diverticulosis. And of those people, about 4 to 15% of those people will develop what's known as diverticulitis, which is not the same as diverticulosis. Diverticulosis is the pouches. Diverticulitis is an infection of those pouches. Uh, other conditions we've talked about were uh, colon cancer. Colon cancer is a, a very common cancer, although it is decreasing in this country um, and it has been for the last 10 to 15 years. The reason it's been decreasing is because more people are getting screened uh, using colonoscopy. Uh, the incidence is about, about 230, 240 people uh, per every 100,000. Um, and um, Oh, actually, I take it back. That's what I'm, I'm thinking of ultimate colitis. Uh, about 50,000 people in this country die each year from uh, colon cancer, and about 150,000 new cases each year uh, in this country uh, are diagnosed for, with, with colon cancer. Uh, the exact uh, reason people get colon cancer uh, could be many different things. There's many different risk factors for colon cancer. Uh, fatty foods, people who eat a lot of saturated fats or have a lot of fat in their diet. Uh, obesity itself is considered a risk factor. Um, diabetes, although the diabetes is likely also from the fact that uh, type 2 diabetics are usually overweight. Um, there's uh, smoking is a risk factor. Um, heavy alcohol use is a risk factor. And then certain inflammatory conditions, people who have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis are more prone to getting colon cancer as well. African Americans are at higher risk for colon cancer. Um, so certainly those people obviously need to be screened probably sooner and maybe more even more frequently potentially um, than people who have uh, um, a lower risk. In general, the lifetime risk uh, in this country is about 4%. So about four out of every 100 people will develop colon cancer at some point in their lifetime. Although those risks, you know, those risks are probably a little smaller for people who don't have risk factors. That takes into account everyone, um, whether or not you have risk factors or, or not. Um, ulcerative colitis, we have talked a little bit about ulcerative colitis, as I just mentioned before, has you know, an incidence of about 230 to 240 people per uh, 100,000 in this country. Ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory condition uh, which affects the top layer of the mucosal layer of the colon. And it can cause things like bleeding and diarrhea, abdominal pain, uh, weight loss. Um, and it's somewhat distinct, although in the same category as Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease uh, can affect anywhere in the, in the body, not just the colon, like ulcerative colitis. It can affect the small intestine. It can affect even the stomach or uh, the mouth area as well, though that's very rare. Uh, Crohn's disease is what's known as a transmural inflammation, meaning it affects the entire uh, thickness of the intestinal tract. And because of that, the symptoms can be a little bit different. People can develop fistulas, which are connections between different organs. It can develop abscesses, which are little pockets of pus or uh, inflammation. Uh, but they can also present with similar symptoms as well, like diarrhea, weight loss, bleeding, and abdominal pain. I think, you, yeah, you got, I think you got a lot in there. Um, so let's talk about prevention strategies. What are some tips that um, individuals can do to keep their colon health? That's a good question. So especially now uh, with Colon Cancer Awareness Month, obviously people are thinking a little bit more, although we should be thinking about it all year round. Um, certainly uh, some things we can do at home are just obviously diet. So cut, you know, if you're having red meat four or five times a week, try to eat more fish lean meats, chicken, turkey, uh, cut back on saturated fats, uh, exercise, that's a big thing, you know, sedentary lifestyle, uh, obesity, those things are big risk factors for uh, colon cancer as well. Try to cut back on your alcohol consumption and 
uh, no, no more than probably one to two uh, drinks a day at the most, uh, stop smoking. Uh, but truthfully, the biggest thing we can do is get screened. Okay? So anybody who is a screening age, uh, 50 is sort of the national screening age, although the American Cancer Society came out last year and recommended uh, screening beginning at the age of 45. So we are starting to screen people a little bit earlier. African Americans should also be screened likely at 45 as well because they do have a, a higher risk for colon cancer. Um, if you decide, you know what, I really don't want to do a colonoscopy, there are at least other things you can do to get screened. There's something called a coligar, which is a fecal DNA test that actually tests for the genetic material found in colon cancer and some larger polyps. And it also detects, detects blood in the stool as well. So that it is an approved screening test uh, and is, while not quite as good a test or as accurate a test as a colonoscopy, <clears throat> excuse me, it still is a alternative option. Uh, you can do things like a virtual colonoscopy, which is a special CAT scan that does 3D reconstruction of the colon. It is a nice option to look for uh, colon polyps and colon cancer. The problem with it is that if you do have colon polyps, you basically still need a colonoscopy to then remove those polyps. But for people who maybe can't get sedation because they have underlying breathing problems or because they maybe are on blood thinners and they can't go off the blood thinners, it is another alternative option for people who maybe can't get a colonoscopy for whatever reason. So you were talking about a lot of diagnostic tools. So you brought up colo, uh, Cologuard. Um, can you maybe explain to the audience a little bit uh, what's the difference between Cologuard, the FIT test, the fecal occult blood test, sure. and then we'll get into a whole other level of questioning on the on the diagnostic yeah. tools. So uh, fecal occult blood testing uh, is just a way to test for blood in the stool. Uh, it's not specific for colon cancer. Uh, in fact, blood even from the upper tract. So if you had uh, like an ulcer or something like that, you'd be occult blood positive, or you could be occult blood positive. Um, but it is a nice generalized screening test. The nice part about it is it's cheap, uh, very readily available. And almost any doctor's office has it available. Um, but there are some false positives as well. So you have to take the information that you get sort of with a grain of salt. Um, you mentioned FIT testing, which is fecal immunochemical testing. It's a little bit more specific. It actually tests for the globulin uh, or the protein found in human blood. So there's much less false positives as far as other things that can make the test positive, but it still is only testing for blood. So if you have hemorrhoids or something else that's causing blood, it doesn't differentiate between that and colon cancer, but still is a nice screening test. It's a little bit more expensive, but certainly very readily available um, in most doctor's offices at this point. And then obviously the Cologuard, which is really a combination of this uh, fit testing uh, with the DNA testing as well. And so it's a little bit more um, specific and a little bit more sensitive to looking for colon cancer and colon polyps, but also still can have some false positives uh, as well. So now you also talked about uh, colonoscopy. So can you explain to our audience what the difference between like endo, uh, an endoscopy is versus a colonoscopy? So colon uh, colonoscopy is a endoscopic test. Um, where you take a camera that has a light on the end of it. It's a flexible um, uh, device that goes into the rectum, which is the opening of the colon, and looks around the colon uh, to look for polyps, colon cancer. Sometimes we'll use it for other reasons. People are having bleeding or other problems, abdominal pain, to look to see what's going on in the colon. Uh, and then endoscopy uh, technically usually refers more towards an upper uh, scope. So you're, when you're looking into the stomach through the mouth, that's usually an endoscopy, although they are all endoscopic procedures. It gets a little confusing, but, uh, um, but there is a difference and uh, depends on obviously what types of symptoms you're having, uh, which will help determine what, which tests you do. We do endoscopy for people who have uh, you know, long-standing reflux or would suspect ulcers if they're having some bleeding potentially. Uh, people who have Barrett's esophagus um, who need to be screened because uh, they're at higher risk for esophageal cancer, they would require regular endoscopies or EGDs. So um, out of all those diagnostic tools that you discussed, and maybe you share with the audience, 
which one is most effective and why is it most effective? Because otherwise, you know, should people go out and get the fit versus, right. you know what I mean? So the colonoscopy certainly is still considered the gold standard uh, for testing and diagnosis. It's the most sensitive, the most specific test. Um, and it really is a test that I would recommend unless there's other reasons that you can't get the colonoscopy. Um, the the uh, Cologuard is certainly a viable option. I think it's a nice option for um, either people who uh, maybe don't have access to uh, a colonoscopy. Maybe they live in an area where there's not uh, a gastroenterologist readily available. Uh, maybe someone who has a lot of underlying medical conditions, breathing issues or heart issues, and they're looking just to get screened. And if it's obviously if it's a positive test, they have to realize that they would be sent then for a colonoscopy but it may be a nice initial uh, test. It also may have a role at some point um, down the road for people who have a normal colonoscopy and are told, listen, you can come back in 10 years. Maybe at some point we would start considering doing uh, Cologuard in between to continue to look until they're ready for their next colonoscopy. But that's not really an approved use of the, of the uh, test as of right now. Um, right now it is approved as a screening test but probably not necessarily the best option if, you, if you're otherwise healthy can get a colonoscopy. Okay. And let's just refresh for our audience, like at what age, what's the guidelines for getting screened at a colonoscopy? You, you did touch about some of that with some of the other um, sectors of our community, but overall. So at this point, really, it, it's age 45 is really now according to the American Cancer Society, although some of the other uh, societies have not necessarily followed suit. So your insurance company may not pay for it at 45. They may still uh, be waiting till you turn 50. Um, certainly African Americans, that's pretty well known at this point that every, everyone um, should be screened at 45 if you're African American uh, because of the higher risk for colon cancer. Um, but certainly if you're 50, you should get screened. Uh, obviously, if you have a family history of colon cancer or you have a family history of colon polyps or if you have ulcerative colitis or some other type of predisposing condition, then you may need to be screened sooner because the recommendations can vary depending on the condition. Uh, usually that's a good time to say to your doctor, listen, this is what's going on or these are my family history. Uh, when should I get my colonoscopy? And so what is the frequency? Is it every five years, every 10 years? Could you also maybe elaborate yeah, sure. on that so as well? That um, unfortunately also depends a little bit uh, on what is found at the initial colonoscopy. If you have a normal colonoscopy and you have no family history and you're just average risk, then you can go in theory 10 years to your next colonoscopy. Um, if you have a personal history of colon polyps or they find polyps on your last colonoscopy, then you may be told that you need it more frequently, usually in that three to five year range. Uh, people who have ulcerative colitis, for example, uh, may need it yearly, uh, depending on how long they've had the colitis for or every other year, um, certainly much more frequently than every 10 years because their risk is gonna be higher for colon cancer. Thank you. So now let's talk also about symptoms. So you started to talk about a little bit about some, but what are some of the symptoms that individuals should look out for that there might be so, you know, some signs of sure. issues? So certainly um, regarding symptoms, anybody who has uh, a sudden change in bowel habits, uh, you know, you normally go to the bathroom every day and all of a sudden you now are going once a week or you're going every other day or every third day, that should at least raise a red flag to say, hmm, what's going on? Now, a lot of times it can be absolutely nothing. It could be that you started a new medication or maybe you're a little dehydrated or you're not eating enough fiber, uh, but it certainly should be something that you should at least bring up with your doctor and discuss. Uh, anybody who's noticing blood in their stool, uh, red blood or darker colored blood, uh, anybody who has new uh, abdominal pain or unusual weight loss, uh, anybody who all of a sudden becomes anemic, they have some blood work done by their primary doctor and they're now anemic and they're not sure why, those people certainly uh, uh, should raise a red flag and should get a colonoscopy. Um, I'm not here obviously to alarm people. You know, if you're 20 years old and all of a sudden you become constipated one day, that's not likely to be colon cancer. Uh, but certainly anybody who has these symptoms who is of screening age should certainly get a colonoscopy. 
On the other hand, you don't want to ignore it even if you're younger because the incidence of colon cancer is increasing in the, in the younger population as well. So these are certainly symptoms that you do want to pass by your doctor and just make sure that everything uh, is normal uh, as far as that's concerned. The hard part with colon cancer is some people don't have any symptoms. Uh, they may not have symptoms until it's more advanced. So you don't want to wait and say, listen, I'm 55, I've never had a colonoscopy, but I don't have any symptoms, so I probably don't need to get screened. Uh, you should still get screened when you turn 50 because you may not have symptoms. I've certainly over the years have found many people who've had colon cancer who came in for a normal screening colonoscopy and had no symptoms. Wow. Well, that's very helpful. <laughs> very good to know. So um, at this time, um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience just to give our audience members um, an opportunity to ask a few. And I'm sure we have some. Um, Okay, um, so right now as people are typing in, um, can you maybe also explain to us like how much of diet, you know, within the diet plays a role and how much of your diet should be plant-based fruits and vegetables or, uh, or what role fiber plays into it as well? Yeah, I mean, listen, diet certainly does play a role as it plays a role with a lot of different things in our lives. Um, I don't want people to start thinking that if they eat a healthy diet, they're not at risk for colon cancer. Um, you know, certainly cutting back on the saturated fats, uh, you should have a high fiber diet. Everyone should have a high fiber diet. Um, you know, probably aiming for somewhere between at a minimum 25 grams uh, of uh, dietary fiber a day. Uh, men need a little bit more, probably upwards of 30 to 35 grams of fiber a day. Uh, and that can be from a lot of different things. It can be from different uh, vegetables, it can be from uh, fruits, um, it can be from whole grain breads, uh, but you can also get fiber as a fiber supplement. So there's many different things on the market, um, psyllium based fiber, uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to uh, uh, touch base on uh, specific name, uh, name brand products, uh, so I will avoid them at this point, but certainly you can go to your local pharmacy and there's many different fiber supplements available uh, at, any, at any one of these stores. And your, the pharmacist there can certainly help you get some supplemental fiber if you're not getting enough fiber in your diet on a regular basis. So here's a question from one of our audience members. When, uh, what should one eat or not eat when having an ulcerated colitis flare up? So that's a good question. So they've looked extensively at, uh, at ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And I have a lot of patients who come in and usually the first thing they ask is, what type of diet should I be on? Uh, unfortunately, there's no specific diet for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, it's sort of the same type of thing as we recommend for uh, everyone else. Obviously, you should be on a high fiber diet and uh, you know, cutting back on the fats uh, in your diet. But someone who's having a flare, as this person uh, had mentioned the ulcerative colitis flare, uh, typically, fiber is not well tolerated when you're having an ulcerative colitis flare. So when there's a lot of inflammation in the colon, fiber tends to be a little bit irritating, and it does tend to uh, probably make some of the symptoms worse. So usually we recommend more of a bland diet when someone's having an ulcerative colitis flare. So cutting back on the fiber, uh, you know, that brat diet that people talk about, so sort of the bananas and the rice and toast and apples that kind of thing is probably a little bit easier tolerated. I usually recommend when people are having uh, an ulcerative colitis flare to avoid milk products because people can become lactose intolerant when you expose the intestinal tract uh, to lactose when there's a lot of inflammation. So usually uh, as the colitis is being treated and the symptoms get better, you can start reintroducing uh, fiber uh, back into the diet and milk products as well. So um, how effective are over-the-counter products in dealing with, you know, fiber-based products that are dealing with constipation? I see that a lot, uh, a lot of individuals may be purchasing those. Yeah, I mean, they certainly, listen, fiber does help. Uh, I think a misconception that a lot of people have is that fiber is a laxative. It's not really a laxative. It's a bulking agent. So it does help to make the stool larger. It helps to move the stool a little bit smoother through the intestinal tract. Uh, helps to draw some water in. So it helps in, in our natural process. So sometimes some mild constipation uh, may be helpful to have some additional fiber 
and that may help you go a little bit more. But it's very important when you take in more fiber, you have to take in more fluid. Uh, you also have to exercise, right? So if you sit on the couch all day long, you can eat a lot of fiber, but it may not help you go to the bathroom. Uh, I always sort of equate it for my patients. Imagine taking a big bag of powdered uh, cement, pouring it into a wheelbarrow and just putting in just a little water. You end up with a brick. And that's what happens when you add a lot of fiber, but not a lot of water. So it's very important to drink a lot of fluids. Uh, and coffee or caffeinated products don't count because you end up urinating out a lot of that fluid because it is diuretic. Um, but so some people, you can add in the fiber, but you may still need a laxative. Uh, there are a lot of different prescription laxatives available. There's some over-the-counter laxatives available uh, as well, and that may be necessary in, in conjunction with the fiber supplements. But that's typically an area where I usually recommend if you're having those type of issues, you should probably speak to your doctor to find out which medication is the best option for you because they all have a little bit different side effects. They all have a little bit uh, different potential uh, to interact with other medications. So that's a good time to speak to your doctor and find out what's, uh, what's the best option. So does one's color of one's stool or shape of stool indicate any type of conditions or issues one might have? Uh, yes and no. Um, certainly, uh, if you're seeing red stool or black stool, uh, that may be an indication that there's some blood. Uh, now, people who take iron supplements, for example, can have black stool. Uh, it's usually a, a blackish green color, but it can sometimes look like bloody stools. So that can sometimes be confusing for people. Uh, Pepto-Bismol, for example, can cause black stools. Um, and people often don't realize that they take Pepto-Bismol because they had a little diarrhea and then the stools turn black and they think that they're bleeding, but it's just the medication itself. It's the bismuth component of the medication that causes the stool to turn black. Um, but stool can range. It can be um, brown, it can be tan, it can be yellow, sometimes depending on how much bile you have mixed in with the stool, that can change the color of the stool as well. Uh, gray or white color stools traditionally can sometimes indicate that there's a problem with your bile ducts or your gallbladder area. And so sometimes if that happens, that's also an indication to go and see your doctor. Usually that's in conjunction with some yellowing of your skin. Uh, the urine may look dark, it may look like iced tea, um, but if you start seeing darker urine, yellow to the skin, uh, clay or white colored stools, that's also an indication to get in to see your doctor uh, immediately as there may be a different problem going on. Very interesting. Um, just see. I think that is all the questions we have from our audience. Unless anybody has any last minute questions. Um, otherwise, then this will actually conclude today's webinar. Um, we want to thank you for joining oh, uh, us. Thank, thank you for you having me. For I, the audience. I hope uh, you know, this has helped uh, you know, some people who are out there looking and maybe having uh, concerns, and this will help them uh, guide them maybe a little bit, uh, or at the very least get them in to see their doctor. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And thank you again. Um, just a reminder um, that the opinions shared here today by our medical expert are not a substitute for medical advice from your physician. If you need a physician, please call 1-888-724-7123. For more information about Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, please log on to www.rwjbh.org backslash Somerset. Thank you again and have a great day.